our mission here at Azure is to give you raw data that you can actually trust for using a very simple workflows that work for you. So we're not actually here to change your workflow. All we're trying to do is help you get better analysis. Okay. Now, what we have is a very simple workflow as far as what you see here for Western blotting. A lot of us have done it before. But what we can, what happens here though in this workflow, a lot of error can be introduced. Like in the loading of the gel, you know, how much do we actually load? Or did we load equal amounts in each lane? You know, did our transfer occur? Did our transfer occur equally? So there's a couple of different things, you know. Are my antibodies binding in the linear range that I can actually see? You know, do I have my thing? Of course, to get a linear signal, we're better off to actually use fluorescence, and we'll talk about this a little bit, and and then actually do the analysis. You know, is it robust protocol so I can actually get good data coming out of it? All right. So normalization controls. The reason why we actually do this is so that we can actually take care of the errors and loading and a total load error. Okay. All right, because what we're trying to basically figure out is are we loading the same amount of protein in each and every lane? Or also, to, in some cases, we do actually do have a biological error. So that's going to be the question also. So that's part of the reason why we're trying to figure out by using a total protein loading. All right. Transform unity. That's the other question is. Is did our did our transfer really work well? Was our sandwich set up correctly? Okay. And then the other question is, are we going to be using housekeeping proteins or are we going to use a total protein stain? Okay. So here's the methods. We're going to do a little comparison, but they're they're very similar. All right. Housekeeping proteins, what we're actually looking at here is we were going to rely upon a single sample being loaded across equally across the, the entire gel and block. Often the proteins that we're going to be using are highly expressed. All right. And so and the accuracy is going to depend more or less on the expression of the housekeeper across the entire experimental conditions and all the treatments. Okay. So now the total protein stains, what we're going to be looking at for that, we can actually use a combination of different proteins that are going to be found in each and every lane, which is going to actually take and minimize the amount of air and variability from lane to lane. So it will correct actually two more for the protein loading and transfer inefficiencies. And we can actually check and, and monitor to see our protein transfer. So as soon as we are finished, with our transfer, we can actually go ahead and stain and we can actually take a look at the proteins before we actually even go move on to the other steps and continue on with the Western blotting. Okay. So, now, what we've been finding is that there are a number of peer reviewed journals are strongly suggesting to move to protein normal, total protein normalization. And it's just more than just one, so it's just not only us. So it's a journal of biological chemistry. They actually say normalizing signals to a total protein low is essential for them to actually get good data. What they're also suggesting here is housekeeping proteins uh, should not be used for normalization without evidence that the manipulations do not affect expression. So if there's any changes in your biological uh, experiment, that's where it should be coming from, not from something on the outside. Also, what they're suggesting here, too, is that the linear relationship between signal and intensity and the mass or the volume of the sample loaded must be confirmed for each and every antigen. So that means you, for every target that you're looking at, you're going to have to go back and confirm. Okay. If you're using a housekeeping. Proteomics, what they're saying is the total protein staining uh, represents an actual amount that's loaded, which is more accurate than actually using a housekeeping protein. Okay, and that's because of minor 
changes and technical variations that you're going to have within your, your standard or your sample. And nature also suggests two loading controls such as gap DH and actin must be ran on the same block. Okay, so this actually runs into a little bit of problems also. So they, what they're asking for sample controls on different gels must be identified as such and dis distinctly loaded as controls. Okay. So what a lot of people are doing if they're using housekeeping proteins is they'll actually run a couple of different things. There are about three different experiments they will run. So in one experiment, what they will actually do is they'll take and run an entire Western block, and then they'll probe for the protein of interest, like their phosphorylated protein, and then they will come back and strip and then reprobe again for the total protein that they know it's there. The problem that you're running to here, though, is that when you're stripping repro reprobing a lot, you are going to lose protein. So what some people will do is actually take and cut their Western blots so when, and take and cut them horizontally. Okay. And by doing that, then they what they have to do is they will use gap DH. And and like on this particular example, they're using PERC and gap, D, gap DH and then actually trying to look for the, the standard that way when using the housekeeping proteins. All right. Or the other way they would do this is actually taking just run two separate gels, assuming that everything's going to be the same, but it's not always the same. Because once you run two separate gels and do two separate blots, you have two separate experiments. Okay. Now, stripping and reprobing is always a trade off between how much antibody you're actually going to have and not have. Right. Another thing that runs issue that we run into, especially with ECL, is actually with the ghost banding and its impact on normalization. What we actually do see here is we had four different substrates that we did run, and you would expect that as you loaded more protein, you would get a better signal. But as we can see here, what we actually start getting due to the enzyme kinetics of the reaction is we actually start getting burnout or ghost banding. And that's what we're showing over here on the right. So what's actually linear, it would be right over where the gold line is going across on the top. Okay. So I can see radiance was one of the better ones that actually at 0 0.993 as far as its normalization would go. Now, if we're going to compare normalization stains, if we're going to be using little protein stains, the one protein stain that we do have that we offer is Azure Red. Okay. And what Azure Red does is it actually gives you a much broader total protein zone, um, uh, micrograms of total protein that you actually can use. So if you can see here in Pound Celeste on the very top, it's fairly limited. As far as the micrograms of protein, we're basically saying somewhere from 21 to maybe 100. That's where it's actually going to be its best. Cypher Ruby works really well in a very small, uh, lower range, one to about uh, 40 or 50 micrograms of protein. Kamasi, which is fairly low. Amino Black is even lower than Kamasi. You have stain free techniques, but then Azure Red, we can actually go from 0.1 all to about 80 micrograms of protein and still be linear. Okay. The idea. So this one we actually did use transparent. So you can actually see there that we have our R squared is actually 0.99. So we got over four orders of linear dynamic range on these who are red. Okay. Now so besides having excellent linearity, if we would take and look at here, this particular Western blot was just done in fluorescence. And what we actually did is use tubulin, beta actin, and gap DH, which are commonly used uh, housekeeping proteins. And do notice on here that we actually did load them. There are squares that they're fairly flat and fairly linear. 
there's not really that much of a, a dynamic range, where if you look at the R square for the Azure Red, it's 0.99. So, actually, take and see, you get better linearity by using your Azure Red with your total protein. So if we actually want to compare the two different methods right here, there's total protein stain and actually to the gap DH. And so the volume that we actually do use is on the blue line there. So we can actually see that we have 0.99 as far as our R squared. On gap DH, which is the gold line, that one is 8.89, just Leonard and nine, which, and then the one that's actually in the middle would be a Ponso S, and that's fine. Okay. So, how does the Azure Red fit into your workflow? You have your traditional workflow that you normally would do: separate your proteins, transfer it on the brain, on your membrane. Then all you're doing is adding one step that adds about 30 minutes to it. Is your total protein stain with Azure Red? Then you will block, and then you'll finish your Western blocks as your protocols as you normally do. Okay. All right, so you can see it fits very easily into your workflow with no major changes. All right. So what we would want to do is fig, try to figure out which one would actually work best for you. Okay, so that would be the next step is finding out if the camera system or if the Sapphire would actually work better. Okay. Okay, so with that being said, and everything's going pretty well, we're going to go ahead and move on to Azure Spot. Azure Spot is our analysis software. And as you can see here, we actually do have four different modules within Azure Spot. We have the 1D uh, gel and Western blot analysis. We have the analysis toolbox, which is analysis toolbox is going to be very useful for uh, very similar to what you're used to if you've done ImageJ before, or if you've used some of the other um, analysis software programs that have been out on the market for a while. The 1D gel and Western blot analysis is actually done for with lanes and bands, and this is also where we're gonna do our normalization. We do have an array analysis, so if you're doing 96 well plates, we can do those, and we do have colony counting. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to go ahead and click on the 1D gel. All right. As you can see, it takes and opens up our window for us. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to go straight across. The first thing to come to is open an image. So what I'm going to do is say open a multiplex image. I click on that. And then what I'm going to look for it's just right here. It's a DS. It's a data set. So it's going to have all four channels in there. And I'm going to say, go ahead and open. All right. So now it's opened up all of my channels for me. Okay. So we can look at this as either a single channels, or if you wish, we can see it in a channel overview. So that's your red channel, your green, your blue, and then it'll be your total protein. Okay. So one of the first things we're going to have to do is come over here and create our lanes. All right. So when I go to create my lanes, the in lanes of interest are actually right here. The molecular weight marker was just used to make sure that we can actually get a an efficient transfer. So I'm actually interested in these bands here. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and open this up and I will go to, I can pick any one I want. And so I actually have two, four, six lanes that I'm going to do. So I'll open this up to six. Increase this up to about 90%. And then what I'm going to do is actually take, I'm gonna zoom in first. So I can see better. And then I'm going to come up here and go at the upper left hand corner. I'm going to drag and drop. Okay. So as you can see, 
Now this will fill in on each and every one of our channels. Now, <clears throat> I do need to adjust this a little bit. As you can see, not all of the lanes are perfectly in the center. So what I can do is come over and say bend and resize. I can take and grab it just like so, and move it just a little bit. Move that over just a little bit. That looks pretty good. For channel number three, channel number four looks good. And channel number two looks good. All right, actually, I can move channel number two over just a little bit just by clicking on the single. So I can just to take and adjust the single lanes right here, just like so. So I can adjust either the whole lane or just the single lane. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're actually going to do our background subtraction. I'm going to go ahead and click on my background subtraction. And on here, as you can see, we have a number of different options for our background subtraction. What we actually can do is actually, the first one we actually come to is a rolling ball. So go ahead and click on the rolling ball. Now with the rolling ball, what this will actually do for us is it takes in consideration the changes in the background from the top of the lane to the bottom of the lane. So as you can see, it follows the contour. The best way to think about this is rather than see this as a peak, just invert the whole thing and think of it as a valley. And what we're looking for is a ball with a radius that's going to go smoothly across this. Right? And on top of that, the other nice thing about the software, you don't have to remember what everything does because as soon as you click on that option, it tells you right up here in the left-hand corner what it actually does. The next one that we come to, let's move on, is going to be the rubber band. And the rubber band, if you Think about stretching a rubber band from one end all the way down to the other end. All right, so that give you a proximate background that way. Minimum profile. So in the minimum profile, what we're going to do is find the lowest point down here and draw a straight line all the way across. Okay. If you want to, we can actually say we can take and make our own background. Just by finding our point or if you wish we can actually do manual subtraction just by coming over here and just left clicking and moving them as we see but that is very time consuming and it's not very reproducible our suggestion is always to go with the rolling ball once we have a rolling ball the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check all the rest of them said so all the rest of the channels they all have everything selected okay so next what we're going to move to is band detection and we click on band detection what we're going to come up with is what we're looking for is the minimum slope of the line all right so with the minimum slope of the line basically how tall is that peak that's what we're looking at what's the slope of the peak so what we're going to do is say, go ahead and detect. And as you can see, it did a pretty good job of detecting all the bands. Let's check channel number three. We need to go, we need to go in and add it to each one individually. Now, if you wish, rather than use the automated detection, we can go in and we can do it manually just by left clicking over the top of the bands. Okay. Now, if we left click, we can add the band. And if we right click over the top of the band, we can make it go away. Or we can come over here to the histogram and add it back. Okay. Now, we are not going to do molecular weight size on this one. You could if you wanted to, but I'm not going to. Because our main goal on this one is actually going to be normalization. So now that we come to normalization, we have a number of different ways that we can actually take and normalize, right? So this is no normalization, or if we want to, we can use in our software, we can use housekeeping proteins if you wish to. So you can go ahead and click on it, and then what you will actually take and do is say, choose which channel you're gonna normalize against. So I'm gonna normalize against channel number two. I'm gonna say housekeeping, 
And so what this does, it takes the largest band across the housekeeping channel, which is number two, and it will use that to calculate the normalization factor. Okay, did everybody get that one? I guess, okay. Or the other way that we can actually do this is we can actually take and say, like, we're going to use channel number one, which is our total protein channel. I will say I'm going to do a total protein normalization. So fine. I, instead, I'm going to use channel number one, and I'll use reference lane number one, because I know it has the lowest, greatest load. Now, when I go to each and every one of them, everything is normalized against channel number one. So all your lanes and all your other channels are normalized against that. Is that making sense? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, so now that we have all of our data, we can actually take, and if you want to, we can look at this as an overlay. And then you can see all your data over here is actually overlaid for each and every one of your channels. So that's lane number six. If we want to, we can look at lane number one. Just by clicking on it. There we go. So there's lane number one. Okay. Now, the important thing more than anything else is actually getting our data out. So to get our data out, what we're going to do is we will actually take and select on select the single channel. So like channel number two would be the first one we're going to pull out. Export, export measurement to Excel. And then our Excel spreadsheet will pop up. And there's all your normalized volumes are right there. Okay. Now we can use either look at these as a total lane or we can look at lane data and be able to see what our normalization factors are for each and every one of the channels and for each and every one of the lanes. Okay. And to get that data out, all we need to do is here is go to clipboard, export to Excel, and then once Excel is finished, we have all the data right here. Okay, so that gives you all your factors of normalization. So now everything will be normalized to channel number one. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so now, if you wish, you can have an automated report, which we done here at the end. And what the analysis report will give you, when we click on reports, and we come over and click on analysis report, this will actually take and generate a PDF for you with all the data and all the information that goes along with it. This is something you can actually go ahead and put into your uh, electronic notebook. So as you can see, it tells you exactly how everything was done for each and every one of your lanes. Okay. All right. Now, if you want to generate your own, what we actually can do, say that this one, uh, this is actually lane. So our different lanes that we actually do have here. So this is actually taken for lane number one. So if we want to, we can actually take here and say we can go to export to clipboard. If you want, we can actually take and grab the image window. <clears throat> and we can go ahead and click and we can actually paste the image window there. Now, what we also can do is if what you're looking to do, we can actually take a look at the volume versus the normalized volume. 
So what we can do here is actually say we want to go from here to here. I'm going to come over here and I say I want volume. And I want my normalized volume as a comparison. Insert, make sure you have my data set up right. Charts. Let's go click OK. And there you go. So this actually does show you your volume that you're getting, which is volume is, is defined as intensity times area. Okay. So your peak height is actually your intensity times your area underneath the curve. As you can see in the first lane, it's pretty close. In lane number two, they're off a little bit. Three, they're way off. And as you can see, as they start to decrease in the amount that's loaded, there is a large difference between the two volumes. All right? That's the Azor Biosystems. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and send them off to info at azorasystems.com back into our website.